get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise All right, well, let's rock this Cleveland Indians versus Chicago Cubs style right now. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com. It's where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have top entrepreneur and business strategist, Vinny Fisher. Using his 10 plus years experience as a tax and business lawyer, he started his entrepreneurial journey in 2007 and since has grown businesses to seven, eight, and nine figures, generating over $300 million in gross revenue for his own companies. Just to give you an example, he started, this is amazing, we're gonna dig deep in some of these. He started nine locations for adults with disabilities, an information publishing company, a web hosting company, brain host that grossed over $100 million, a website security company, Site Trust, which I didn't even know he started until I started digging into the research, a health supplement company, and is presently founder and CEO of Fully Accountable. They act as a CFO for your company. It's really cool. It's a done-for-you back-office solution that allows you to make data-driven decisions based on your numbers. He's also founder, that wasn't enough, Vinny, founder of Total CEO, an education company that caters to CEOs to help grow and scale their company. And I have some notes in here for Vinny to talk about the terms growing and scaling. And he is the author of The CEO's Mindset, which I bought the other day because I immediately wanted to download the audio version. Yes, CEO's Mindset, how to break through to the next level. And oh yeah, four kids, married for over 20 years. Vinny, thanks for joining me. Hey Jeremy, thanks for having me. It's a crazy intro. It's crazy. <laughs> I want to start with one thing. you know. I know that you really value your family and yeah. your kids and your wife. And so I wanted to start off with how do you set up your day to spend time with your family and pay attention to your businesses and maybe talk early on days, uh, but start now. How do you yep. set up your schedule now so that you can, you do try and do everything? You know, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I, I want to tell you a great story. I have yeah. lunch with my wife and I, I, we had the privilege of building a lifestyle early on when our kids were young. And so early we homeschooled our kids because we were oh, really? selfish and we wanted all of our time. Mm. So for our children, we thought, what's the best way to get the most time with them? Well, let's homeschool them. Let's see if we can break them as much as possible at home as opposed to letting the system break in. We did a great job of that. Yeah. And so all for your kids, did you homeschool all, all four of them? All four, right? Yeah. Now the oldest two, uh, now the oldest three, we're, are, we're a little older, right? We go 15, 13, 11, and nine. So only our nine-year-old is left at home. Our goal, in, at least in the Fisher family, was to get him through into sixth grade. And so we have a high schooler, soon to be high schooler, and a, a advanced middle schooler. And so, um, but one of the things early on was in our business, I was really, we had almost 500 employees in the building at one point. Wow. And I was as you can imagine, being pulled in a couple different directions with very young four children. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And my wife said to me once, hey, let's go ahead and have lunch or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, let's, 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 let's do that, babe. And uh, I said, well, come on. I mean, we do lots of things together. I made this joke with her. And she's like, you know, you, you only uh, truly make time for the things you want to do. And she kind of hit me with that. And she said, really, the evidence of what you truly want to do is represented on your calendar. Right. So why don't we pull up your calendar mm. and see what time you're slotting in for your family? And we went and she looked. She said that to you? Yeah. Wow. Smart so woman. We, wow, that's amazing. Well, she, yeah. She's, you know, thankfully, my wife is, uh, knows exactly who she married. And what, the, yeah. what, the, what I needed from, the Lord yeah. knew I needed was someone who wasn't just going to be a trophy wife, but could, was going to be an active yeah. participant in the bettering yeah. of me and our family. And so she says that, hits me in the face pretty hard. I do the standard defensive husband mood. Hey, I'll do it. Come on, come on, come on. Well, I hand her my calendar and, and I, my family's nowhere on it. 
Mm. All my meetings and appointments with people wonderful like you or other people, they're on there, but nothing for my yeah. family. And that changed that day. Mm. When so, was that? Gosh. Like how long ago? That was probably five years ago. Mm. It was a big change, almost six years ago now. It was a big changer for us. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I remember because my, my oldest was in uh, fourth grade. And uh, I kind of remember, I would always try to make it, I was the weird dad who would make it to like the pumpkin patch thing or show up to the stuff at school. And people are always like, like, what's he do? Is he like unemployed loser? Like, how is he able to show up to all that stuff? So I was always cool in that stuff. But literally, the, 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 the quantity of time versus the quality of time didn't exist. So for example, I wasn't necessarily engaged. When I went home, my, I didn't have so, solitude of what I would do. So I, I, this thing controlled my life. Yeah. So if it rang, I answered it. Yeah. So now we just have things that I mark out. So when I'm home at a certain time, I actually don't turn it off. I turn it over. Because mm -hmm. what happens to me isn't that it rings. It's the flash of what I look at that grabs my attention. So now in, a good tip right. is what I would tell people is if you're in a meeting or even if you're home, just turn it over. You'd be right. shocked right. how less intrusive it is. I, I, I always have it on stun gun mode on anything I do. So I don't even hear ding or dung. I don't ever hear any of that. So as soon as I turned it over, it was a changer, a game changer yeah. for me. And uh, so I... I will tell you, looking today, looking backward, the more I invest in my wife and children, the better my business is run. Hmm. And so if I could show you, you just can't see it. But I work on this stuff a lot. So like there on my chart is my little yeah. black book. I'll take notes in front of you. But what you didn't see on there was recently, this is a picture of my day. So if like, like if you see it, yeah. it's a picture of my day. And I'm kind of model out what my day looks like to my family. And on there is... A pie chart I decided to, to cut out like what does my day really yeah, look like? yeah is this just advice I'm giving to people or do I really do this and so right. I have to sleep for me I have to be somewhere around seven eight hours or I turn into the scratchy bear that I already am even worse. <laughs> right. and so I shoot for seven hopefully eight hours of sleep yeah um, I give myself now something this is I very valuable so thank you for sharing cool. this yeah I give myself something I never used to give myself and it's three hours of time in there's an hour of working out an hour of personal development, mm -hmm. and an hour of creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I give myself that time. When do you tend like to go to bed and wake up? I'm, a, I'm not a night owl. I married one, so she covers the second shift at the house. Mm. But um, I, I, like, for example, I was up and out of the house and did my workout at 5 a.m. this morning. Mm -hmm. So I was up efficiently because I'm inherently lazy, so I don't want to wake up way too early. But so... 4.40, I was up, I was yeah. at the gym by five, home and showered, and sitting at my favorite office known as a breakfast place at 7 a.m., yeah. already working through my own first personal hour. From seven to eight, it's for me. Yeah. I'll do devotional time, I'll read something inspiring, I'll work on things like character building, self-awareness stuff, that's my first hour. My second hour, when I see creative stuff, I'm literally working on creativity of things I lead, mm. either other leaders or my family. So kind of like flavor of the month type thing. Mm -hmm. But those are my three hours yeah. right there. What now, do you, there. How do you structure the creativity? What do you do? Are you sitting down with a notebook? What does that look like? That, okay. I think the, I, I literally... I know we're mutual friends with a guy named Ed O'Keefe and he had a guy, Mark Devine there and you and I both got to see him. I really love some of the stuff Mark Devine said and he and a lot of other people are trying to like clear your mind, right? Yeah. And so I gravitated to some of his message because I'm a big fan of clear your mind. And for me, I, I have this visual of a windshield wiper where I'm just trying to wipe out junk out of my head right. and let come to me what comes into my head and I'm an active note taker. I'm taking notes while we're talking. Like yeah. this morning, this was my breakfast meeting. I had a core I drew out about like I was thinking about kind of like if I was holistically thinking about the mission of our business and if I am thinking about that, what have I built? Have I built things that are on or off mission and what have I communicated? What vision have I shown our team? Have I drifted us down a road where I either need to pivot or kill things? And this morning I was just reflecting on some of my leadership in which direction have we taken it? And um, I was I was laying over top of that this concept of key differentiation. Okay. Was I allowing for some of my own natural key differentiation to show up in our stuff? And so I don't think that happens 
without removal of stuff. Yeah. I don't think you can have that when the phone's ringing yeah. or you're sitting in your office and everyone wants to knock on your door and ask you the ask the soothsayer questions and right you're right cuz you know we all who are we're we're on the everybody listening is the master of their domain, right? Yeah. And so where do we get our nourishment from? I mean, it can come from a multitude of counselors. So sometimes that creative could be having a breakfast with somebody else. Yeah. Um, I get great uh, inspiration from helping other people work through their problems. I always say, you're living your nightmare, I'm not. <laughs> right. And so it's it's a little easier for me to work through that with you. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of times the best person receiving counsel in that situation is me because I'm working through uh, your issues. And so I, I get fed greatly from that. And, you know, I'm a big believer in reading some of your own stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I'll go back and I've read my book five times. People are like, well, that's rather arrogant of you. Sometimes I'll get in there and I'll be like, wow, that's really good. When did I say that? <laughs> and sometimes right. they think like, it's the name of your show. Yeah. You're inspired into things that you've done. And I think you got to go back and reflect and marinate on, the, sure. on the journey of where wisdoms come from. Yeah. So I read this one. Um, you know, I'm just going back to my stack and yeah. I read my first one. I read, these are on my reading list all the time. And I don't, I think too many people are in a hurry to read too many books. I love reading. I'm a big reader, but I think your favorite books, the ones you resonate the most yeah, with yeah. need to come up to the top of the stack every so often. Yeah. And so for me, I read, uh, you know, that Victor Frankl book, Sir, Man's Search Man's for Search Me. Man's Search for Me. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. Classic, right? Yeah. But I don't think it's a read once book. For me, it's like the Bible. Every time mm. you open it, it's like, what? What did Moses say? You're like, there's this, always this new thing, right? And right. so I think I love guys, our friends, who are like, here's the hundred books I've read. I'm more intrigued by here are the three that have inspired me right. the most. Yeah. Because I want to know what those are. Yeah. And I would encourage all of our friends listening to go back and whatever those are, don't be in a journey to read too many books. Be in a hurry to go back to the ones that impacted you the most. And for me, they change a little bit. It depends on the season of life. Yeah. Right? right now, I'm in this like Yeah, what are you into role, now? Right? Yeah. I'm the old guy now. And when did I become that? I walked into a room. I'm like, how did I? Everyone's looking to for advice. So I'm in um, very wisdom-seeking things for leading my children, for our leaders. So I'm a... It looks probably a lot like self-awareness and personal development, but that's the stuff I'm reading more than I'm reading tactical stuff right now. So, Vinny, the chart you drew on your in your notebook, which business yeah. was that for? The, the breakfast for meeting. a company called Total CEO. Okay, okay. Yep, and so it's mission. I, I write it out. By the way, I encourage you to do this. I write out the mission every time I'm doing something like that. So when I'm drawing stuff, what... How do you reflect onto your team or the world, the vision of it, if you don't know what it is? So right. the mission of that company is a training and education company to help develop CEOs with leadership and strategy skills for leading an entire company, not just the part they're good at. Yeah. And I created that business because I want to fix a hole in the marketplace. And the first place I discovered that hole was in me. I'm an excellent salesman. I'm a pretty darn good product developer. I absolutely sucked at the other four areas of the company. And so much to the point of abdicating them. I famously broke a very successful uh, hosting company because of not paying attention to all parts of the business. And so we might not be talking about this wealthy millionaire on the phone. We might add another comma or a different zero set had I not done some of that. So I've changed this part of my life to... Um, People ask me, like, why are you in the service businesses now? These are hard things when you're such a great product guy. Right. And uh, so when I was drawing this morning, I was consumed with, was I a little bit off mission? Yeah. Am I so good at building products that I was building one product after another? Or am I still on mission? Is everything I'm building for the CEO? And the reason yeah. I brought you asked that and why I was drawing it. Yeah. One of my scale opportunities there is once I grow it and I've got the privilege to scale, it's going to be off me developing and training coaches in our way of doing mm. it. Because I, I have a real struggle with people out there coaching today who might have just slept at a Holiday Inn or read a good book <laughs> and lack some way to do it. And uh, mm. joking aside, I'm very thankful people step up to be coaches. It's a tough job. And quite honestly, I'm not sure even I'm great at it. What I am good at is training coaches and equipping them with how to work with a CEO. So um, I just was, do I, I noticed some mission creep in some of the stuff I was doing today. So 
I want to talk about what you found, if there were any discrepancies that you have to, yeah. to to talk about. But, you know, you talk about in the CEO's mindset this exact thing, which you encourage people to find and write your mission statement so you know if you're on or off track. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, what? I, you, and by the way, like, I just ran out. This is like book new. Like, it was, I just pick up another one and keep going. And so, it's in my car because I was reading it this morning. It's not, is it in here? Oh, I brought it in with me. Cool. So um, I brought my backup. I always bring it with me for a while. So one of the things I encourage people to do is to continually be writing down your, your mission. Yeah. And so, um, so I literally, just a few weeks ago, was rewriting it over and over and over until it's a clear statement. Yeah. Now, you might have to change it. Where you might have written something that sounded nice, hallmarky, and all this great, and then you line up what you do as a company against what you wrote, and you're like, "Freak, that's not at all what we do." Where I wrote, and I think you got to be honest with yourself. And so one of the reasons yeah. you need to have something clear as the owner is what the freak are you telling your people? Because lots of times when I peek under the hood of businesses, teams seem great, they're just misfocused and they lack clarity. And that is, you know, if I could show you, you know, this is something every day. I'll just take it off the wall. This is me, right? So if you lead... If you're, yeah, if you're listening, it says lead with vision. Yeah, lead with vision, right? Where there's no vision, the people perish, right? And so what, what if we the leaders cannot communicate our vision to people, it starts with this lack of foundation yeah. where you don't have anything clearly identified. So we call me the chief disruption officer around here. Right. I wake up every day starting three companies. <laughs> and by noon, I have to talk myself out of them. Right. And so the mission actually, I think it's holistically important for the entire company, but I think it's the most important for me. And the reason I say that, it's not just an Apple exercise because I've got cultural values around our company. Right. Literally, those three companies I wake up and I dream about, I write inside this nice fancy book. Well, if one of them is to open up a copycat of Digital Marketer, or hey, you know what? I want to be Inspired Insider today. And none of that fits within my company's goals, our mission. I need to kill it as fast as possible. Right. Well, if I don't have that on the wall, if yeah. I don't have that like literally tattooed on my heart, yeah. then how do I know what I'm protecting against? Yeah. To me, I'll tell you, the number one Achilles heel for business owners isn't the lack of ideas. It's the chasing of too many of them. Right. So, and, yeah, I mean, I want to talk about that for a second. So what great ideas? I mean, you have ideas that you've executed on that yep. have become very successful. What's great ideas that you came up with you knew you could execute and be successful, but you killed it? Because uh, that's, it, I'll yeah. tell you one is the yeah. one you announced in my thing, Site Trust. Mm. I literally, while I was at Brainhost, discovered some security patches in some famous websites out there yeah and big platforms that we now use yeah. i also figured out in our web hosting company how to ping them and discover where people are accessing them inappropriately mm. and i'm like oh my gosh why don't we actually become a site monitor and do that right i built the whole structure for it i come up with that nice fancy name it's i built name. this whole thing yeah great i have a nice site trust.com domain build out the commercial, come up, I'm going nine figure all the way d deep. I'm like, crap, I don't even want to do this. Hmm. I don't even like it. And so there it sits. It's a wonderful opportunity somebody could run with. The technology and the things it does still sits there. But I literally stopped executing on it and it now sits there as something I've invested a few hundred thousand dollars into yeah. and it's just sitting there. Now there's a free service that people can use and it gets, I forget. People some still free. use it though. People still use people, it. People still use it. Yeah. It's sitting there as a free service, but I stopped growing the business because yeah. it was literally taking away from something else yeah. we were doing. That's a there hard decision to make. I'm How, sitting on a home yeah. run yeah. for sure. It would have free premium signups. It for sure is an eight figure business sitting there. Um, you have to pick, you can't serve. So how do you masters. decide at that moment to not pay attention to it? Because that's, you see all the, you know, all the things on the wall, it's successful. You've already started on it. How do you decide it's a hard decision? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think you and I get paid to make those hard decisions. That's what we do, right? So I don't think there's this romantic answer that you're going to like Ernest yeah. Hemingway onto a notebook. <laughs> I, I, uh, 
uh, I relied on some of my wisdom and, and experience and said, which one am I going to execute on? And then I laid it against the mission of what I'm doing. Yeah. And I actually discovered for Vinny Fisher that I like the service business of fixing, you know, there's three main holes that kill businesses. One of them is we always think not enough traffic, right? The real hole is you're in the wrong marketplace or your message is selling to the wrong people. Yeah. But that equates into your offer sucks, right? That's number one why your business closes. Two is uh, the wrong team, right? You didn't build the right team. And the third one is you ran out of cash. Uh, the Italians, we all say the funds are low. Right. And so if there's no cash, you can't run a company. Well, we set out to solve those last two problems in our businesses. And so Citrus didn't fit. Mm. You still didn't own fit. it though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just sitting there. And someday some young strapping entrepreneur is going to show up at my door and say, let's run with that. And I'm going to be like, all right, do I have the bandwidth to be the chairman of the board of that company? And what do you want to do with it? And someone's got to run with that mission and vision and go create it. And it can't be my energy drafting and acting like I can do 14 things at the same time. Mm -hmm. How often do you go back to that? So you have like that diagram that you wrote um, to yep. keep you on focus. How, Every time how I do, you, do you go back to it or is that just writing out enough for you to – kind of have it in, in, in your memory bank to, to keep you accountable to it. One of the best strengths for Vinny Fisher, and I've learned this about myself, is that I can come up with some amazing ideas. One of the worst things that can happen to an operating company is to have too many amazing ideas. Right. We literally need me to draw this out as much as I need to draw it out. Yeah. Is to not let the slow creep of too much other stuff happen. Most of our, I've had almost 2,000 employees and most funerals of good people have been my fault mm. because I've literally had issue creep and I would wake up and go, oh my gosh, we're gonna start a blogging service. <laughs> and so, you know, I owned um, a, a, a website called Scribner.com. I don't know, and I now something else, but I, you know, I used to be a domain addict. Really? I opened, I opened a hosting company on the back of that addiction. I, at one point, I What forget, are your, some of your favorite domains that you've owned? I still own iAffiliate. I love it. I own iAffiliate.com. Um, gosh, I've owned a bunch. Um, my part, old partner and I own Jibber. Uh, we were going to turn on this uh, voice service for that. Um, I own some really good ones still um, that I'm just like stuck holding because I just like in my mind can't let those go. Um, Citrus has been one that people have That's wanted. That's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah like, that one's one that, you know, uh, I've had uh, multiple uh, uh, offers for. And one pretty attractive one. I still have this like, there obviously must be a problem still, Jeremy, because yes. I won't let it go, right? <laughs> so I, like everyone else, have those issues. I, I, we, I don't think I'm ever going to be cured of it. I think we need to put protections around it, which is right. why we jokingly call me the chief disruption officer. Yeah. So our operating businesses, we need to separate me from them. Yeah. And so my, I have a project manager and a content person. So yeah. there's three of us. Right. I'm allowed, and they're not allowed to use any internal resources. Okay. So we've decided as a company to let me invest in two staff positions and they must use external resources. Well, I'm like my own little incubation department. Mm. I'm allowed to go play with things, test stuff. The minute I creep inside of our building and use people, there's already an alert that goes I off see. that says alarm, alarm, alarm. And because I will break it. I at the exp and everyone, you know, I have a little bit of a strong personality that might be a shock for you. <laughs> and so Everyone will, will defer to that. And right. so we've had to put things in place where we have a very open environment that can call. My, our number two, who you know I write about in our book, Rachel, is great. And she has the privilege, along with her entire team, to call me out on issue creep. Right. Right. Only because they hear vision from me on a very regular yeah. basis. And they know what our missions are. And because of that, you know, hey, it can even happen between total CEO people and fully accountable people, which those mm. aren't the same. Right. And yeah. And even there, we could have some of those risks. And so um, we even knew that when we launched Total CEO, which was an idea before Fully Accountable, but we launched Fully Accountable first. And I always say I'm thankful I did. Why is that? Why did you launch that first? Well, we launched the first one because I had a super large accounting department. And at the time, I came up with the idea. And uh, um, it was the hardest thing to build. 
right? It's a back office solution of like doing boring numbers and the things I absolutely hate. Like, I don't want to put together any of that detail. As a matter of fact, I barely want to meet, read my morning report that comes out. Right. I actually, if you could just shoot me out a fortune cookie of the answer and like give me the thing, <laughs> that's all I would want. Right. I would want nothing else. And I built an entire data company off of managing the back end, one to fix our problem yeah. was mine. Like I wrote about that. That's a real story. I didn't make up, not my fancy little copywriter in me, write a sexy story that sounded good for everybody. I can't stand paying attention to the numbers. Like right. I'm addicted to as a matter of fact, anything of the opposite of paying attention to the numbers, I'll do. No matter what. You want to like, if it's pay attention to cash or go play racquetball, I'll go play racquetball. Right. I'll, if it's whatever, cut someone's hair and I don't even know how to cut hair, I'm going to pick cut hair instead of pay attention to that. Well, that is a problem in your business, right? Yeah. So you need to either raise up and be in charge of people who are in control of those areas yeah. or stop doing what you do. And I don't think the solution is abdicate. If you look at the failures as entrepreneurs, it's mostly people who abdicate these parts of their business. It's rare. We joke a lot about an offer and there are some very crappy offers out there. But most guys who lead with delivering value are good at what they do. Yeah. They're experts, right? It's rarely the issue. It's it's almost always abdication of some other area. So even I have to fight that on a daily basis. So I draw that chart out whenever I need to. Or Probably whenever I'm called out by someone on the team. Like, how does that fit? And I'll go back the next day and be like, <laughs> and of course, I'm like a crybaby like everybody else. I'll be mad at first. And what do you know? You don't know what you're talking about. I'm the genius around here. <laughs> and then I'll like next day be like, crap. I think they were right. And I'll go think about it. And what a good it. question that is, right? How does that fit? How does that fit? We should be asking right? ourselves that. Yeah. You know, the guy, you know where I got motivated from that? The guy who grew 1-800-Flowers said, how does that help us sell more flowers? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I saw him on uh, Undercover Boss. <clears throat> Someone asked him what was the key to their success. And he said, how does that help grow more flowers? And the, and the bit was one of the mechanics came up with a way to build in. This was pre all in the technology now how to build in um, GPS so they weren't getting lost on their And he saved like five minutes of service time and he presented it to, to the whatever direct report of the mechanic shop right because they have a fleet of trucks right. and people and they said well how does that help us uh sell more flowers like i'm saving five minutes or some other time over a day for each driver of delivery time that's how we're going to get more flowers in the people's hands mm. and what he said was which stuck with me which is it opened up the creativity of the people in the office when they're on mission they're more creative and so team members when they clearly can see the vision of what exactly you're doing are my people you know everyone always says man i love your team they're just on it well they know what they're on right right and when you do you'd be amazed how often someone will say you know our for total ceo our, our statement is how does that help us uh, save more companies yeah our thing how does that help us save more companies and at fully accountable is how does that help you know your real numbers yeah and so those are our statements so how does that help us accomplish the mission? Come up with that. If you can come up with your, how does that help us sell more flowers tagline? That's cool because it makes it a little more real inside your company. And I would challenge that everybody has that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and later on, remind me to talk to you about what my biggest push I'm on right now. Yeah. And Go it's ahead. The Go for it right now. Yeah. It's the measurement pe pieces. So yeah. I have a friend. I'm very fortunate to have a friend. I only have one. And so, you know, <laughs> it's good to have one. But I have a friend of mine who's... Um, is a billionaire in the making and his lead investor in his company is one and um he's one of the co-founders of a home improvement store that starts with ohm and sounds like depot and um that's just supposed to be funny i need a, i need a better clue than that sorry no. <laughs> all right let me back it up i think it's orange or blue or okay. something like that and so um well we were talking one day and he was describing, I was describing to him something about the company. And this was in the middle of, we grew up a company called Leading Health, a big health supplement company. And it's before we sold it. And uh, I was joking about um, affiliate sales and how like, you know, we really got to be intimate. And he's like, so what's the measurement tool for evaluating your affiliate manager? I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, like, like uh, get more affiliates. He's like, what? 
And he just, I remember him stopping me in the middle and said, if a team member, he says employees, I say team members. So he said, if an employee does not know how to measure their job to mm. the specific one function they do, mm. how do they know when they're being successful or not? Yeah. He said, that's how all the large companies who are successful run. Yeah. He said, if you're not successful, it's because of that. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I went under the hood and started testing this theory. And gosh darn it, he's right. So I practiced kind of a triangle. I call it the team triangle. Yeah. You got to build, which means grow your team, which is hiring and development and finding the right people. And you got to train them. You got to develop them. You got to you got to invest in them. And the last one is you got to measure them. Mm. And, I, and I'll go ahead and, you know, I don't think I told your people this, but we'll give some free gifts out. So a lot of the things we're talking about, I'll leave it at our both our brand names. One is the totalceo.com and the other one's fullyaccountable.com. Both of them forward splash inspired. We'll leave the relevant gifts to those companies yeah. for your people. So one of them's on this team piece, this team triangle. And in there, I'm focused on the third piece of that. I focus on the first two all the time. But right now, I'm like a dog on a bone on this last one. Measure. Measure, yeah. Okay. And it's the way for team members to be managed, right? So there's this argument that if you're a doer, you might be the one managing yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. So it isn't just managed in a capsule like you manage other people. Sometimes you could be managing yourself. Well, he said to me, okay, let me ask you. He's, he started role playing with me. So let me ask you, because when I meet with my salesman, what do you think his only core metric I want to hear from him about is? I'm like, He's like, don't overthink this. I'm like, Good question. Uh, new sales? He's like, exactly. He goes, I don't want to hear like how they fix the dialer. I don't want to hear that they improved conversions. How many new sales did he drive through the door? So then I started going with this and I built out a tool, which I'll share with your, your, your crew. Great. Yeah. Entrepreneurs need this of like, literally what are the, what's one core metric that you should measure. And so to give some flavor to this, like a CFO should only have, one core metric. And I might add from that core metric, typically we've learned that there are probably three sub metrics that come out of it, but a CFO should only be measuring one. And that is the profit margin of the company, hmm. not profit. Like the reason that's a bad metric to measure is if the industry standard of, of an information company, well, let's pick on, um, let's pick on fully accountable since, We'll just pick on my companies. Yeah. A service business that provides that kind of service should have between a 30 and 35% profit margin at the bottom. Mm. So the nat you go look it up. The industry trends should yeah. be about 33 points. So we should set a target profit margin of, you know, I like to shoot over, not under, of 35 points. Right. And then the prop, the, the, if I said, if the CEO, CFO's job was to focus on profit and we're, we made money this month, then what would we be measuring towards that's good performance for the company? So if I made five grand on a million dollars, but I should have made $330,000, yeah. we got ourselves a problem, yeah. right? Um, you know, service businesses can be a little bit more profit margin, but very hard to scale, right? Yeah. In a products business, like we, we actually have a trend chart too where we can help people with industry trends that we did at Fully Accountable. And so if you care about that, we, we'll have that up for you there. But we, we, we figured out that a good e-commerce business, depending on what type you are, should be around 15 to 20% on the bottom when you're done. Yeah. And so a CFO should set up their profit and loss statement based on that trend. And if you didn't hit 15 points, why? Right. All right. That's enough beating up on the CFO. No, I like this. You know, because I noticed when I was doing the research and I was looking at some of the case studies that you you wrote about like the real estate education train company yeah. you not, you not only talk about the revenue but you always are mentioning the percentage of profit, profit. in there yeah because every we none of us if you believe you live in a blue ocean consider and evaluate strongly what you do right. your your differentiator might be the blue ocean but you live within an industry that already exists right 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 i mean it most successful things have existed for a while Right, even Uber is still at its thing a car transportation service. Right. Well, regardless of all that, your efficiencies, the way you do it, might be different. 
you can look on this thing called the Google, G O O G L E dot com. And on there, you can do some research and find out whether it's an industry trend of what you should expect to profit within your industry. Well, today, that should become your target profit margin. And your whole business should be run off that. I, I heard a guy speak um, who was the founder of uh, LegalZoom, who's now the CEO of, uh, what's that company with Jessica uh, Alvis? Oh, the uh, Honest Company. The, the Honest, Honest Company. They're yeah. about to get. Somebody's taken them out, some wonderful funding. Well, somebody asked, I think Roland Fraser asked him a great question. Like, should I be focused on growth or profitability? Mm. And he's, I love his answer because it's, it's what we talk about all the yeah. time here. With, he said, no one should be focused on growth unless they have an unlimited source of funding. Everyone else should be focused on profitability. Mm. So unless your acquisition model is all to grow customers and absolute no fear of closing because you don't lack capital, otherwise everybody should be focused on profit first, right? And not just profit first, profit margin first. Yeah. Because if, if you don't have something to grow to, how do you know if your payroll crept up too much or your indirect expenses are too high? Or, so that's why the CFO is... One core metric should be profit margin. So yeah. I was joking around with someone in our industry recently, and they said, okay, what should my affiliate manager be focused on? I'm like, all right, let's talk about it. And they're like, signing up new affiliates? I'm like, do you care if you have a lot of affiliates? At one point at Brainhouse, I had 22,500 affiliates. Wow. I don't know anyone else who's grown other than Amazon, some big affiliate programs like that. And so yeah. I grew a big one. That was not the metric, right? Yeah. The metric is new sales by affiliates, mm. whether they're existing. Actual or, results. Right? Yeah. So I only want to hear from my affiliate manager through a lens of new sales by existing or new affiliates. That gives you the privilege to go back and get some sales from existing ones or go after new ones. But you have a target this month to make so much in new sales. And the problem I have with existing sales is salesmen need to go out and re-hunt. And so the metric has to be new sales. And so I'll give you a great one. Customer service manager. Let's let's play along to make sure we're paying attention yeah, to yeah. setting up for your tribe. What should be the metric of a customer service manager? A customer service manager? Um, I mean, people not dropping is one. I mean, retention of a customer. Okay. So those are all good sub-metrics. The one they should pay attention to is refund rate. Hmm. You have an established one. You probably have an industry standard on one, and then you have yours, right? Right. And if yours is high or low, then you start looking at some of these submetrics. What's our call time? Does our package get there when it's promised? Is our are our people properly trained in the way they communicate with our consumers? Those submetrics come out of the one that starts with the immediate result we get from our consumers, right? And so I start talking to customer service managers about that. And it, like, boom, like, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So here's a great one. Let's go right to the top. Let, first off, you need to know that a project manager to me is a COO. So a COO is just a glorified title or a promoted title of a project manager. Right. So what's the COO's only metric? See, I'm, I'm, I immediately go to obviously to make sure operations run smoothly. So how do you okay, measure right, so to make there. sure operations run smoothly? Okay, but that's yeah. too loose, right? right so how right, do I find right. what runs smoothly? So when you think about a COO's job, they're like the master project manager who run other project managers, right? So a COO's job is whoever reports to them, whether it's layered or just very uh, small in a company, is to make sure those people are measuring their metric. Right. So a CEO's only job, if done correctly, is to make sure each right. team member, one, has a metric, and two, is defining and measuring their job through that metric. That's it. A COO shouldn't do anything else, hmm. right? And so that's their job. And, but then when you start looking at what everyone does, you start seeing that they, like, they dabble a little here. They dabble a little there. And, you know, they did a survey. What is the number one reason that either employees drift off or leave from a company. It's dissatisfaction in their job. Yeah. One, because they don't know how to do it. Two, they don't know what their job is. Right. And three, they'll always say, I'm not trained properly in my job. And I think that is a problem that comes from the symptom of not knowing what their job is. Yeah. And what we discovered, and we've been doing this now, we got, I think, over 100 companies that bought into my crap and are trying this. And um, they... They, here's what they're reporting back to us. The satisf 
satisfaction level of the team members have gone up significantly because they know how to identify a win, which means if I know know how to identify a win, I'm quick to recognize a loss. Right. Right? Yeah. And so if I know how to measure my job, I know immediately if I'm not measuring it correctly, if I'm not living up to that measurement. I'll tell you, it's it's been a game changer. Yeah. And so it's the do- it's the bone I'm on big time right now about if we can get more companies having team members measure their job, I believe we could really impact payroll creep and dissatisfaction in jobs. And if we can impact yeah. those two things, I think we can really impact fail rate big time. Yeah. What I love and hate about talking to you, Vinny, is that now that generates about 15 more questions that I have about, <laughs> one, growing an affiliate. I mean, you, you'll casually mention, oh, we grew to 22,000. So I obviously want to know how you grew that because you do use that across your businesses. Also, going back to the beginning, you know, we talked about the measuring part, but the building and training, obviously, you've done also. So yeah. start with the, the growing affiliates. What were yeah, some so, of the key things that you were able to implement? Because you do that across your companies that made you so successful with that. The phone. I know it sounds strange. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a telephone I'm holding in my hand. It's the handset. So when I built my army of affiliates, yeah. I didn't have all, some of the fancy technology that even exists right now. Yeah. But I would do some of the same exact guerrilla tactics I did back then that I, would, that I could do right now. Mm-hmm. And I probably would grow faster. Now, I like competitive tools for learning where traffic is running, like similar web and some other things. So I'm all about reverse engineering. Yeah. And if you can't get your hands on some stuff, you know, I would encourage you to share with your tribe. Go find some of that stuff Roland Frazier's putting out there about competitive analysis. Right. That's good stuff, man, because yeah. in there are good nuggets on to find where affiliates are running traffic. But to me, literally, I go, I don't try to reinvent anything. Right. I'm a hospitality freak. And so that's what I am. Yeah. I pick up the phone and talk to people. I'll write people a message. I will stalk the crap out of them. So Facebook was around. Yeah. So what I did is work, look at who you really naturally run around with or associate with. And so what I would do is find out the one or two people I wanted to talk to, and I would go surf their friend list. And I would scour it and find mm. the five or six I wanted to talk to. And then I would go stalk them. And so then I'd go find five or six more and I'd go stalk them. Next thing you know, I built up this list of 300. that And I these wanted. were like top affiliates that you were looking at, yeah. And I would say, you know, if I wanted to find, you know, one of the things about in a web hosting company is, you know, we want to help people take action. The first action they had to take was build their website. Yeah. You know, you got to remember something. Now everyone's got Wix and all these things. This was before all that existed. So I came up with my own web builder. Yeah. No one had that, right? My old business partner and I cleverly came up with a sales offer to a thing. So we went and approached business opportunity people, bloggers, you know, uh, site migration people and said, you know, the first thing that people need to do is put a website up. Yeah. Why don't we help your people put one up? And we wrote an offer to do that. So I went and stalked every possible business opportunity person I get my hands on to and would call them and say, hey, man, you know what we should do? And they go, well, why do we want to work with you? I'm like, well, we pay the most. Oh yeah, how do you do that? I went and found this is a key. I don't. I'm not a big super affiliate fan anymore because it's like chasing a unicorn. Yeah. One, they want all the money, and two, they're hard to get. Um, but I one or two whales wasn't so bad because then I would extort the crap out of them <laughs> and be like, hey, look who I'm working with, and I'd show the EPCs and you know I did things like um, if they wouldn't respond to me, I'd, I'd send them a check. And say, here's the commission that you could have missed last week, but go ahead and cash that because I know you're going to want to work with me. Mm. It would always get a phone call back. You know, if you guys go back and look on the Wayback Machine long enough, you'll see these super large affiliate commission checks that we went to this company, big blank checks, and uh, had they were actual negotiable checks and people were walking into the bank. That's amazing. And they had our name on the bottom of them. And we did everything we could to help affiliates make money. And um, there's a sub small percentage of affiliates that want to help um, their people do the next step. And so I don't think enough people, so the money part's great. Right. But I think where the money meets helping someone is the most important part of an affiliate program. So right. what I is I, the reason I went to the business opportunity people is because they wanted to help their people take a next step. They didn't just want to sell them some information. Right. So I met them right at, here's the next step. Right. 
And so if I had a health supplement company, I mean, even the guys over at, you know, you name them, the ones who are big supplement guys who went and killed it on ClickBank, they just copied my model. They went and met the information people exactly where they needed to be and said, hey, you know what you should do with information? Let's give them some supplements. What will right. be the first thing you do you mail out to your people? I mean, it was well documented at that point. And so we don't have enough of that. People, you know, like a good friend of ours, a friend of yours, uh, launched a health company recently where he's helping doctors with integrative medicine. And, um, you know, it was great. The affiliates now are the doctors themselves. Right. Because it's solving a need, right? And so that's where I would go. Is But I learned something, and your people need to know this. It's a hack. I would rather have hundreds and hundreds of affiliates sending me one or two sales a day. Yeah. 10 affiliates sending me 100 sales a day because the business was too volatile. Mm. And there's a lot more of the one and two sales a day people than there are the 100 sales a day. And that army will feed on itself and build on itself. And so there's more people who are great. You know, if I had a service that was, uh, you know, great health tips for uh, your family, I'd be going after the blogging moms like, like crazy. Right. I'd be after like, you know, you know, Beth Moore, Christian circles and the top religious thinkers and, you know, you name it. Right. And they because that's where all these moms are who care mm. the most about their children are. And everyone wants to go after like the networks and the super affiliates. And I just like SEO, everyone fought after two words. We should think of affiliate management like that. Go after the long tail. Mm -hmm. go after the little ones, because you go build out 50 of those. Those, one, they're easier to get. Two, they don't make any money now. So they're like, yeah, someone wants to pay me. Right. And three, um, you, you'll you find out that creating a spread of more people talking about your business. So literally, as soon as I started taking on hundreds of affiliates, we, we, we literally, we were getting them faster than we could have them sign up for because people were seeing us everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it, it started building on itself. So... Of those 22,500, you I'll tell you the punchline, only 20% of them really sent solid sales. Right, right. You know, all kinds of zeros sitting there. But I used to like some of those zeros because I'd tell my affiliate manager, you call on those existing ones who signed up. Get them to send one sale. Right. What's the hardest sale to get an affiliate to send? It's yeah. the first one. Right. And so we worked real hard at our affiliate program. And you know what we did? We worked hard at getting rid of all the complication. And we just stalked people and we talked to them. We would use a tool. There's some great tools out there now. We use a tool called Excel Spreadsheet. Right. And we'd take your name down and we'd write all this stuff. But now there's these great programs out there that allow you to kind of track your last communication with them and yeah. do stuff. And so, um, I believe a lot in, you know, I have a whole stack of them here. Thank you notes. Yeah. I, 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 I literally send out five or ten a week. Wow. Um, I don't think anybody who's focused on sales should get too far away from the element that worked. And the ones who are looking for like, what's the fastest way to sign up affiliates and try to find a way to not communicate, man, not to pick on the millennials out there, but yeah. every one of my millennials want to do everything they can to I am, not email, not over communicate and hope that magically things get done. Well, I'll tell you. It's, it's that one to one personal connection. Yeah. It's you can try to beat it, but you can't. Yeah. So that's really, quite honestly, what's what blew that up for us yeah. was good old fashioned guerrilla marketing techniques, and don't get away from them. So the you know the measuring is a component, but then the building and yeah. the training. So building's not easy. I, I know I've listened to several interviews you've done, and you say yeah, like there's people who you thought were amazing who didn't work yep. out, and there are people you weren't sure about who became some of your best people. So yeah. can you talk about how do you build, bring on, hire those right people? Yeah. So first off, there has to be a, a, an agreement for your people and us. There's things set out there, be quick, slow to slow or quick to hire. Right. 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 As long, and, and then there's this like, what is it? Slow to hire, quick to fire. Right. Right. I no longer believe in the first part of that premise. Yeah. Quicker, fast, higher, as long as the second half is honored. Right. That is, once you know, you know, you got to kill them. Right. Because it's not compassionate to do anything other than that. Yeah. It's not compassionate for them. It's not good for the rest of your team. So with that in mind, 
that if you're willing to be quick to let go of someone from the team, quick to fire, it's okay to say the word, even when some of my own friends can't say fire because they don't even want to do it. But let's Hard assume is. that firing is a, a premise that you're willing to live with. Then here's what I would say. The small businesses, you've, you've heard me talk about this. It's unique to you and me. We are the heartbeat of our company. And if you don't know what's unique about you, boy, I would have saved thousands of headaches in my company. No, nah, maybe not that, hundreds for sure of, of wrong hires had I been more dialed into what our culture was about. Hmm. And your culture is you. right? So hmm. I talk about this in my book, The CEO's Mindset, yeah. about finding your heartbeat. Yeah. And finding your heartbeat, everyone goes through, we, we practice down trickle-down benefits from large companies in America. We don't really get things uniquely built to the small business, but there's something unique to us in the small business. Even though we make up almost 65% of the daily payroll here in America, which is huge, huge we yeah. get trickle down benefits from the large corporations. And so the large corporations talk of things about culture, values, like it's this thing above and beyond like the owner, and it is. But for the small business, you and me, we are its culture. Right. And if you start filling it with people that don't culturally fit in with you, well, then you're going to have a heart attack. Right. And that's if you look at your teams, they're misaligned because people hire for competence over character. Now, everyone's character is defined a little differently. There's like this. There's not one universal thing for character. Like you, I serve a god of disorder, and so for me, I don't necessarily do well with organization. <laughs> I just don't. I, I'm probably more of a tie-dye and flip-flop kind of guy. Well, that's a weakness of mine that we protect right. against. Right. And, and that's okay. But it's actually not a critical fact to me about character. I have a friend of mine, I'll just call him Brad, who cares about the super organization of things. And if you handed him a resume that was wrinkled, he'd go nuts. Right. For me, I don't care if you're crumpled up and throw it at me because right. I don't care about those things. But I'll tell you what I do care about. I'll ask you questions. Like I was trained in an environment where lying and making yourself better was a good thing. And so I care a lot about even white lies. And I, I will investigate and hunt for that because I don't want that around us. Right. I do not believe in gossiping so much so that you will be dead in our company. I believe in 100% transparency. I believe if we say we're going to do something, we either tell on ourselves or we get it done. And I have a list of five of these things that I believe in. And um, they matter to our company. And when we're interviewing people, we make up this list so that we're interviewing, we're finding people who line up with that stuff. Yeah. I didn't know how to be a lawyer until I was trained to be one. So I can't just hire someone. So I don't care about, I care about their minimum subset and we make them take a test. Yeah. So if you're going to be an accountant in our company, you better have a base skill set in accounting. But with all things equal on that, I don't make our hiring decision about who's a better accountant. Right. The decision's about who fits in to the character of the company. And then we're placing, we're filling a hole with the right role. And we've looking for a way to say no to somebody. If I, I practice more of a standard of this reverse hiring, once I have my armed, what we call cultural wall in place, which is really just a subset of values about me, yeah. that's what allows us to be wrong less. And when we're wrong, yeah. we fire real fast. But I'll tell you, the small business, Jeremy, needs to really be guarding. We, we say stuff like, oh, I'm terrible at hiring or I you know I, I really don't want a large staff we're almost like um anti-abundance with that thinking it's like yeah I really want to only let my company be so successful and if it has to have more employees well I don't really want to let it be that successful it's like this crazy thing we'll talk ourselves into yeah. and uh, I think what we mean is we don't we just don't want to get burned by managing people who we hate right. and I would say don't put people in your company you hate and you're like how do you do that yeah there's a lot of good people out there. We need to stop hunting for great people. It's a unicorn. Hunt for good people who can be trained. Don't hire for competence. In about 90 days, when they finally caught up that they know what SEO means, or they, they know how to necessarily put an exit pop on a website, well, then competence is gone. Right. And now it's about they actually know what the word blog means. And now it's about something else, right? Imagine hiring someone to put up all your podcasts and you were out there looking for someone with expertise on the pro 
process of putting out podcasts and you couldn't stand how they work with you, in about 90 days, you're either going to slit their throat or your own. Right. That's how most hiring happens today is because we think we're hiring for a job that needs to be mm. done. And we forget that even ourselves learn how to do something. And so I wish I could get everyone to throw away the competence piece. Yeah. Test for You can test up front for a minimum skill set and then only be interviewing people with the skill set. And then take skill set out of the way and only interview. And I have all those resources for your people for free. It's this reverse hiring standard. You should be a barbarian at the gate looking for reasons to say no. So I didn't tell you my number one biggest one. You can't yell at me. My wife knows this. Team knows this. I can't be yelled at. So I'll say stuff. Oh, really? in I can't be yelled at. I'm completely done the minute you yell at me. And so, um, and I have to work through that. Maybe take some medication, do some things. <laughs> I got to work through that. I just cannot be yelled at. I get it. People are passionate. It's when it turns on to me directly versus mm. about the issue is where I have a problem. So I'll ask interview questions like, hey, tell me about the last fight you got in the office and how did you handle it? Right. Oh, I told that so-and-so off. I stood up for myself. I'm like, oh, yeah, good for you. What did you do? Oh, yeah, man, I stood my ground. I said in front of the whole office, I yelled, and they don't realize I'm taking notes, okay? Likes to yell, doesn't really care about. So, okay, they're a yeller. And then what I'll do later on in the interview is I'll ask some more yelling questions. So in a fight with your wife, mm -hmm. how do you resolve it? Do you usually use yelling or logic and shut down? Which one do you use? Oh, I have a problem with yelling. And so, da, da, da. okay, cool. So, all right, when you handle a resolution with another team member, have you ever found yourself in a fight? Oh, I don't fight. Oh, but you said you were a yeller. Did you ever yell at any other teammates? Oh, yeah. And then I will literally granularly, I'm looking for character yeah. misalignments with mine. Okay, so when's the, when's the last time you promised something to somebody and you didn't deliver it on time? How did you handle it? Oh, I've always delivered it on time. So you have 100% of your life always deliver things on time. And then we'll, right, we're getting into a conversation. I, you're the, law, the lawyer comes out and you a little bit. Well, yeah. but I'm caring about you, the person. Yeah, yeah. Because suddenly if people they're going to fit. Well, yeah. suddenly people are like, what's your favorite color? What's your least favorite trait? If you were, it was you and a dog and a cat, who would you pick? What does that have to do with anything to do with work? Like right. I would tell every interviewer, to go on a self-awareness thing and think about the things that you yeah. hate the most about yeah. yourself and put those on the wall and make sure you're guarding about against those with other people because you're looking for character alignment because who, who gets the most benefit of the doubt in your life? You do, right? And if you get the most benefit of the doubt in life, then you should be aligned with people who you're going to give the benefit of the doubt to. Now, right. that does not mean duplicate yourself. Because the last thing this company needs is another Vinnie Fisher. We have enough vision in this company for a blind village. We don't need any more of that. We need executors. We need some organized people. We need people who are technicians at certain things who have the same character makeup that I have, yeah. who are wickedly open to transparency, who are okay with being called out on their core weaknesses for the purposes of developing up, who will use yelling as a direct last measure We'll do everything they can never to talk about somebody unless they're standing in front of them. Yeah. These are things we care about, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's how we interview for people. Yeah. I know it's a long answer, but... No, thanks for sharing, yeah. It's allowed us to, to yeah. be wrong less. Yeah, it, it requires a lot of self-awareness to do that. It requires a substantial amount of self-awareness, which is why we take people through that self-awareness piece. And all that stuff's available to your people. They can find it in our book. They can find it in some of our download materials. But we... I want, I'll tell you something right now, I have a, a, a mission to change 100,000 entrepreneurs from not failing for this reason. And I'll tell you, there would be less dissatisfied team members and there'd be more, more of you and me growing beyond our shadows if we equipped people who belonged in our team and not, comp, not keep hunting for people who don't belong on our team. Because yeah. they belong on somebody's team, just not yours. Right, right. Everyone belongs somewhere. And I don't believe that you live in a part of, like I just got done with a client who lives outside of Toronto. And he's like, yeah, well, we, we, we have a tough time hiring people for the sticks of Toronto. I'm like, why? There's good people right where you are. Yeah. It's not a competence race. The people who race to competence are the ones who race to um, having a, a an erratic heartbeat at, be, at least and a heart attack probably coming. Yeah. And that's the killer of the American small business. Then that turns into payroll creep. And payroll creep turns into cash flow. And cash flow death turns into insolvency. And insolvency turns into now having fights with your wife at home. And you get the mess, right? 
Yeah. Bad hiring ca- is the number it's one. It's bad hiring is the number one wasted expense in companies. So the measure, the building, now the training. Yeah. Now you have them. I mean, you spend all that time, energy, effort, and now you bring them on. And probably most people don't have a training. I mean, what have you found with the training? What, what's kind of? Oh, I'll tell you, most 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 employee members uh, don't get it, and most employers don't know how to do it. Yeah. And um, I would say we we over, sometimes overthink this issue. Um, one, you and I, the entrepreneur, we think we're hiring already ready to go people, and we're like like we tell them once, we're like, oh. What do you mean they don't get this? I spent that whole hour telling them exactly how to do something. It took me five years to figure out. Right. What do you mean they don't get it? Right, right. And so we get almost accosted by the fact of having to spend more time developing somebody. But I'll tell you, um, I believe it internally. I believe it about the two teams that you and I both have in the World Series. You, If you invest in your farm system, it'll keep paying dividends over and right. over. And uh, so uh, training developing your team should be very purposeful. You know, I used to be a lifeguard. And for young kids, they teach this uh, thing that I think is anti-lifeguarding okay. or anti-training uh, of swimming. And that is they walk you in the pool and then they say, okay, let's stick our head in the pool and blow bubbles. Right? I get the concept. Well, I have two young kids, so we're teaching them to swim right now. So I know I exactly what you're talking about. It's getting them to, yeah, yeah. to be familiar with the water. Right. But really, you know, quite honestly, the idea of swimming is a survival technique. So I look at swimming techniques as I look like employee training. Throw mm. them in the deep end. Make sure you have a lo- <laughs> That's, I love this. Go on. Throw them in the deep I end. Love, you know, I, I laugh because in the very beginning, Vinny, you said I'm a nonconformist. This is before we, yeah. you know, we hit record. And, you know, when people say blue, I'm thinking pink. And so this is such a pink I feel like a pink way of thinking of things. So keep going with this. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe in hiring the most youthful people and that's in mind, not in age. Yeah. And sometimes that works out to be both. Yeah. But I'll hire a, a moderately trained someone, either someone out of the marketing department or an analytical person right fresh out of school because I get them on, well, only moderately broken. So I have so much stuff to fix on them. Right. And I believe in throwing them right in the deep end. Yeah. So give me an example. And, what's what's one? But with their life jacket, you you said. No. Not with their life jacket. With with a life preserver close by. Oh, I got you. Okay. So with my daughter, we chucked her right in the pool. And I was in the water swimming and treading water. So if she didn't naturally come up, I'd just pick her up. Right. She wasn't going to drown in a second. She learned how to, to na- we have a natural instinct to do certain things. The problem, what do we need to teach a te- an employee to do? To critically think. And when we spoon feed them this like 90,000 hours of training, we're not, we're not, we're not helping them critically think. Mm. So for my world. Yeah, tell me. I love this. Yeah. I won't, I won't answer questions unless it's a question back at you. But what will I do? I'll go find, so if I'm training someone how to run Facebook ads, I'll go get Ryan Dice's Digital Marketing Lab Facebook thing. I won't go get my own. I'll say, hey, go watch this. So you get a base subset of terminology down. Guess And then guess what we're going to do? What? You're going to go turn on our Facebook account, and you're going to run some ads. <laughs> and you're going to get the right to spend a dollar a day, figure out what works and what doesn't. And you're going to get in there, and you're going to learn how to do it. Instead of blowing 100 hours watching someone else, I'm going to get you doing it. Right. And then you're going to like biff a lot and you're going to come back to me and we're going to go, okay, cool. cool. Now let's go watch that training again after you've went and burnt $300 of our money trying to figure out how to, to get ads that didn't convert. Right. And I'll tell you, far better. You know, you, Pitchers in baseball um, don't just pitch simulated games. They get out and pitch real ones. Right. Right? Yeah. And so... Like a farm system, you don't get to pitch in the major leagues until you know how to do it. So we just lower your budget and your spend, yeah. right? So if someone's going to product develop and that's their job, go make a freaking product. Right. You know, if you're going to be um, a salesman, get the freak on the phone. Don't just watch me making sales calls. Get on and we'll work you through your stuff. So in my world, if you walk into my office and say, hey, um, how do I... Uh, What's that thing again I do where, where people type in their email and it goes into this thing and then it stores it? What do you call that again? I'm like, well, what do you think that would be called? And I'll just sit there and right. stare at them and make them come up with answers. 
We literally, I'll tell you entrepreneurs, if you really want to be critical about what you do, look at how quickly you are. Look at it like parenting. If you're quick to give an answer and you're not quick to shepherd their heart, no. they're not going to critically think. They're going to be like um, a robot for you. Yeah. Have you ever left the house and you wondered if you didn't turn the coffee pot or the um, garage door? Because there's such rote things you do. Well, that's what a team member is like when you are always giving the answers. They don't commit to memory what they're doing. And so have you ever been extremely frustrated where someone seems to be asking you the same question over and over? Well, why are they trained to think anything differently when yeah. you're literally giving them the answer? Yeah. So it might seem harder in the beginning, but I remember a guy once said to me, the struggles of parenting are going to impact you now or later. Which choice are you going to have? Right. And I'm like, ooh. That's kind of deep. Well, <laughs> I take that into parenting. I, I take my parenting principle into to coaching up team members. Yeah. I'm going to invest now or later. So what are some of the tactical things we do? I mean, I'll, again, I'll share some of those with you. But literally, I'm inherently lazy. So I only believe in doing something once. Right. Like I don't want to do something twice. So if I'm going to train you, it's like the genius of this podcast. If this thing wasn't taped, I'd be very upset. Like, what? We're going to do this again? And I guarantee I would shoot it differently the first, second time I did the first time. Yeah. So all of our team trainings are, are videoed. Also, one of the big mistakes I think uh, uh, managers or even owners make is you how somehow think you have to create the structure for the teammate. I make them create it. Mm. Right? You create your checklist. You create your process. You show me that you know how to do your job and document it. I'm shocked when I get on these forums that you and I sit on and people are like, does anybody have any good wikis or checklists that people should have so my best employees don't leave? I'm like, yeah, it's called them. Make them record it now. Start today. And so we have an attitude of, you know, you can walk down a dirt road as long as you're paving behind you. Right, right. right? So every employee has got to think like that. I, it's, so it's the best training tool. So we videotape everything. Um, everyone's required to do at least an hour a week of ongoing training. So if you're a Facebook runner, then you need to do read FAQs or look at the newest, latest, greatest videos out there about running Facebook ads. If you're um, doing affiliate tools, then you need to go out and find out the new competitive research tools that are out there. Everybody in their job has to do something. And then we do things like uh, guest speakings where we let our team members at the company meeting speak about their newest, latest, greatest thing. And someone doesn't know who they are when they're up speaking. You just get picked. Nice. So that's fun. Like, we don't, no one will know today who the guest speaker is. It's going to be somebody. And they get to get up and speak about their thing. Right. But if you're really growing in your job, you're growing in it. So we believe in readily being accountable to your training, right? So there's got to be a direct report. And if you're a lean company of only a few people, then it's you. Um, in my company, I'm never the direct report because I suck at management. So Rachel is the someone you report to, right? And so I'm the visionary and creative person. She is very much the project management person. And then the technicians are whoever they are. And in and, and, and a company of three, I would never wear the role of probably the manager. I'd either be the technician or the creative person. And, um, and so because of that, uh, you know, we, we should have accountability. We should have training that's purposeful. Uh, but most honestly, it's them getting thrown in the deep end and doing it. Yeah. One of the worst things that uh, managers or, or owners could do is spoon feed your people because you're lying to them about the job. And then you can't expect that they're magically going to learn it on their own. you got to be available to grow your people. Yeah. Um, and you're going to invest the time or you can lie to yourself that you're not going to invest the time. But we know that Vinny has to invest so much time in the new people or, or they're not going to turn into something better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Throw them in the deep end. I love Throw that. Throw them in the deep end, yeah. buddy. That's the only way, it's the only way I've learned that effectively works. So and Vinny, you with, break under pressure. Vinny, with Fully Accountable, yeah. can you give me – so people get an idea of what it is um, because someone receives like a report and of their key metrics. And can you talk about some of the decisions people have made because of what they're getting from fully accountable? Cause oh, they, you know yeah. You know, so we know what I love about that service. Like, yeah. It started for me, but you know, just so your audience knows fully yeah. accountable is, is a complete done for you back off a solution in the accounting world. But what we did, that's our unique differentiator is we tied operation to accounting 
most softwares or even accountants out there only deal with the historical aspect of something in the past right. and are reporting that number. We, yeah. under real-time accounting, have tied everything real-time into your CRM, your bank account, your gateway, so we can report the numbers real-time so that you know your cost of acquisition right. as close to real-time as possible. Right. And so what's really cool is we, we report winners and losers. Right. And we, 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 that's what manual, I love about they drive the decisions. So that's yep. what I want you to talk about. You yeah. Know? So for me, you get a report every day if you want that shows you basically your P&L broken down by real money tied to your real operational costs. And everybody's a little bit different, but about 80% of all of our clients have about the same core metrics they want, like labor to revenue ratio and all these things that are their core metrics. Well, What's fun, Jeremy, is since we're reporting the manual part, which is the analyst, forget the fancy dashboard and all the things we have, the secret sauce that is somebody looking at the numbers and telling on it. Because even if you get the fancy dashboard, someone's got to read it. And if you're right, like me, I have right. a disease to reading it. <laughs> and so I just want the answers or I want someone to tell on me. And so what I've watched with great marketers, as soon as we can identify the winners and losers, they're stopping the waste of expense immediately fast. Yeah. We watch companies double and triple their profit margin by making decisions of shutting off traffic that isn't working, killing payroll that shouldn't be there, expense creep, saving a ton of money in taxes. Uh, it's it's the, it's all over the place. But for me to uh, encapsulize your an encapsulize your answer correctly, it's we help them identify winners and and stop the losers. Yeah. When do you think I know you probably can't mention names, but What's been the biggest decision someone made or produced the most results? Maybe they cut a loser, maybe, you know, whatever it was because well, I mean, of that I can that tell report. you guys that yeah. there are a few guys that, you know, one of the early on clients we had was Digital Marketer. And their, their big expansive growth um, was when they realized that they were spending money on traffic they thought was profitable. And so we showed them it wasn't. And that literally changed overnight. Now, they've grown to a sense where we only do certain things for them. And we've graduated most of this internally and trained their team. Mm -hmm. Another one's Ed O'Keefe, right? Your boy. Like, he had a staff of four accountants internally. Wow. Doing book I had no idea. Effort. Yeah. Four internally. And literally, we replaced that cost of less than what one of them was full time wow. with what our service was. And he was doing about two point. Seven million in revenue at the time. Well, we identified so much losers in traffic. Well, he ended up doing 1.3 million in revenue. At 2.7, he wasn't making any money. And when we quickly cut him off, he started making 10%. And before we knew it, he was at a 22% profit margin because of that. Another one is our buddy Kent Clothier over at Real Estate Worldwide. They were having a hybrid model of software and um, sales on the back. And their salespeople on the back, they, they, Kent loves this story, yes and no, but he doesn't mind me telling it. Well, they had an assumption of the salesmen, of their best salesmen were these certain people. And we were able to track time on the call, mm. the leads closed. And as soon as we were able to track time on the call, they thought their best salesman, who was on average on the phone 18 minutes, was closing the most. And that the people who were on the phone actually around 12 minutes had more closes. Mm. And when we fixed him down from 18 to 12, what he did was closed more people. Really? Yep. And so we took a really good salesman and got rid wow. of the chatty Cathy part. And he ended up closing more people. And we didn't fix the chatty Cathy part. The sales manager said, what the heck is he on the phone six more minutes for? Started listening to his calls. Oh, yeah. my gosh. You don't have to tell him about the Magna Carta. Get off that. And just tell him <laughs> about the thing. And right. it's like, so literally, once you have a clear metric in front of you, it yeah. gets a lot easier to manage the people. And that's that. Those are three real stories. I could tell you a whole bunch, yeah. but those guys love they love talking about themselves. So they love me talking about them too. So there you go, a little plug to our friends. But that's the reality of some realness yeah. to it. You know, Vinny. What's also interesting is that I want to hear about that kind of that switch from you were the lawyer, tax yep. and business lawyer for ten years, to entrepreneurship. I mean, you're advising. I think I read somewhere that like you're advising, you know, maybe 20 companies at a time. So it's almost like you're helping run all these companies because you have all these people, uh, you're on retainer. Um, but you do have to make the switch to just your own thing. And what's interesting is you start with the creative learning workshop with nine locations for adults with disabilities. 
that was strange to me to read. I'm like, that, I was like, how did that even happen? But how do you make the transition from tax and business lawyer to full-time entrepreneurship? You know, I'm not convinced that entrepreneurship is for everybody. Yeah. I think it takes a certain uh, level of aptitude and ability to do, and probably thick skin to, to be okay with failure. Yeah. Right? There are really good number twos, threes, fours, and fives that probably need to be on other people's teams and yeah. not suddenly have a good night's sleep and say, I can do this on my own. And so, but I, I quickly on knew I was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I owned my own law firm. I mean, you know, the joke always starts back to the family tells a story where, you know, basically my brother broke his arm and I took over the newspaper route and did it better than him. And he never got it back and the newspaper company fired him and got me. And so ever since then, I've always been a guy. I, I ran my own tax service during law school. Um, but while I was practicing law, yeah. I um, always was helping run other people's businesses better than they could run them. Because I'd see things in it and I'd fix them. And so I was very much a hired gun, got paid a good amount of money. I probably dollar in, dollar out, never made any better money than when I was practicing big boy corporate law because I was running some pretty healthy companies. Um, I The story about the mental retardation business, somewhat irrelevant, but okay. um, I, I just I, thought it was a, like uh, such a. I fixed, I fixed a hole in the law. And after I did that, the client I represented said, yeah, big shot, great, you fixed the hole in the law, but we still, I can't provide that service because there was a conflict of interest. I said, I'll do it. He said, you're just a dumb lawyer. I said, give me a shot. So he gave me a five-year contract and I grew a huge location with 500 employees and nine locations and I went hard and fast. And that was at the time I grew that when our publishing company did 110 million in revenue in wow. 08. And well, so I will tell you, back to your earlier question we never got to the answer on, right. that the was balance. a time the balance when, yeah, yeah. I don't, see, I don't really believe in balance. I believe in priority and perspective. Right. Balance is a tough thing to achieve. I agree, yeah. Right? But I do believe in priority and perspective, and my priorities were out of whack, buddy. And so I was growing two major companies at the time. But, you know, I didn't have a jump, a magical moment. I've always been an entrepreneur type guy. Yeah. Um, I have this need to be in the front of the room, not because I'm the best looking. That makes sense to put the best looking guy in the front of the room, but it's not why. And it's not because uh, I speak the loudest. I probably do speak the loudest. And it's not because I always have an opinion and I have an opinion about anything. And it's probably not because I'm the most passionate, but I, will, I can get passionate about a bowel movement. It's because <laughs> literally I, um, I want to lead. Yeah. Well, I'm willing to take the ball and run with it at all times. There are some major downsides to that. Um, but, you know, I have this urge to not give up when everyone else is willing to. Yeah. And so because of that, I don't fit within someone else's system yeah. very well yeah. unless I'm, 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 I'm working towards the front of that system. And so if you've got that itch about you, you know, there's this funny thing. You know, entrepreneurs have a, a, a desire for a freedom lifestyle. And where that road meets freedom lifestyle, you know, to not have a bunch of stuff versus um, have a, you know, what I mean by a bunch of stuff, a big infrastructure, the freedom lifestyle meets this kind of intersection in the road. Do I want to invest in my freedom lifestyle by investing in people so I don't have to get trapped in my job and, and, and have a, a, an organization that's only going to be a certain size? Or when I hit that freedom lifestyle, do I want to invest in people so that it grows something bigger and it might look corporate and big? In either scenario, I'm untrapping myself from it, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I think there's a bad question out there about do I want to have a freedom business or a big business? I think both struggles are not having the entrepreneur trapped in its day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. One might be smaller in nature. And one might be bigger in nature. But I think it's the same struggle we have. Yeah. And, I don't, and, I, and, I, and so for me, I've always lived in that struggle. Like – all right, if I'm going to do this, like, I don't, it doesn't occur to me that I'm going to build someone else. So I woke up, Jeremy, and I realized I had the most fun helping people fix their problems. Mm. I had way more fun than all the gobs of money my wife and I made selling crap to people who didn't even know they wanted it. And uh, I'm good at it. And I'm not going to knock, but I, I'm having, I'm probably making more dollar on dollar less money right now. I might be building up more equitable value. My cash flow in Thankfully, I don't live the lifestyle that requires, you know, I can't help it, Frank Kern money to, to, to feed that machine. Frank, I had to do it for you, buddy. Sorry. But um, I, I, uh, I, I, I literally am in, impacting more lives and helping more people change. So the, the begging question is why service businesses over all these rock star service and product right. companies you built that didn't require 
acquire you. Well, I still do the same thing. I don't trap myself in these companies. Right. And so you made a comment about how I'm personally consulting 20 companies. Um, some of that's changed. At Total CEO, we continually provide productization and do one-on-many, but we're building up an army of coaches yeah. that do one-on-one. Yeah. Because No, I meant that in reference to your lawyer days when they had you on retainer. Oh, yeah, I got yeah. paid a ton of money to answer questions for companies. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was the hired gun. Man, I, matter of fact, people would still pay me for that right now. I have this wonderful knack of looking at your nightmare because I'm, you know, what's the hardest part of the tree to look at when you're in the forest? It's the top of it, right? Well, I've got this wonderful knack to look at your forest and look at the top of it way better than you stuck at the bottom of the base trying to discover it. Well, I think everybody could look. I just have a better ability to do that. And since I'm so quick to give an opinion, I have a fast one pretty fast, which probably is why I'm not the greatest coach in the world. I'm quick to solution and not so quick to uh, helping you walk through that journey, um, which I think there's some wonderful coaches out there, including our own. But I, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, Jeremy. I, uh, I live it. I love it. And that's why I'm kind of stuck on this journey in life, helping you and I and our friends yeah think differently about really how to grow their businesses properly. Yeah. And so, we talked about earlier growth and scale and hopefully we get there. So Vinny, what did you want to be when you grew up? When you were young? You grew up in you know, New York? Where did you grow up? I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. But you know what? I wanted to uh, play first base for the New York Yankees. You did? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I played baseball until I realized that and I realized I wanted to go to college for baseball. I played soccer and made it that far in my career. So I was athletic enough to do something, yeah. but apparently it wasn't to hit a curveball. And uh, so my dreams were dashed early. And, and, and so I, I didn't have the career set out to do that. And it was somewhere along that way that, you know, people used to always say, boy, you really don't like to give up on your competitive on things and you mm. like to negotiate your way what you don't know about me is I'll negotiate your side of the argument even if you're incapable of doing it because mm. that's the whole fun and magistry of it. So I probably would have been a career negotiator. But I, I wanted to play professional sports. I think mm. I had a dream of a good, healthy subset of what a lot of young boys had. Um, I didn't have the dream to be a fireman or a cop or an actor. Uh, none of those things. I just wanted to play sports. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if I you developed... grew up in like an entrepreneurial household and that's where that stems from. Or, no, I you know? was the dad. I was the child of a professional manager of retail department stores. Hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I love my dad to death, but probably his actions taught me to do the exact opposite hmm. of that. What and, do you mean? You know, I, well, he was kind of in the lower middle management of things and he lacked the ability to impact any change and kind of bought into the belief of some of those things. And that never resonated with me. Now, my mom was a little bit different than that. Um, um, so I probably got the shiny coin syndrome stuff from my mom mm. because she kind of like would go chase all these different things. And she's very kind of center of the party type girl. And uh, so I got some of that from her. But there was – I'm literally the first person that successfully graduated from college wow. with any secondary degrees. Uh, I think I was the only real successful business owner in our family. I broke a cycle of behavior in our home. I did it out of necessity, not out of uh, watching someone else do it. Matter of fact, it's actually one of the tragic things that happened. I learned later in life I was doing things to prove people wrong instead of having help learn from successful mentors along the way. So mm. one of the things I would have done differently was I would have quickly asked people who were successful in front of me how to do stuff instead of figuring it out all on my own. And I spent way too much effort breaking stuff and blowing a million here and a million there, figuring stuff out. And I would have easily kept a whole bunch more of it had I asked uh, thoroughbreds in front of me mm. doing it. Yeah, I would have, would, would have loved to have fixed that. And I hope that that inspires one other person to pick up the phone. And it, it, I, I think everyone should have a desire to stand up on stage someday and get a lifetime achievement award for something and have to point to the first row and thank every person in the first row mm. for their success. Right. That's a wonderful image everyone should have and not get up and hold up this trophy and go, I did it all on my own. Right. That's, a, that's a unicorn. Yeah. Last question. Vinny, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your time. Oh, awesome. Yeah, anyone listening to any of this, um, I've gotten some huge golden gems that I have. Um, I have a page of notes here already. And um, awesome. I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, two things. One, what's been the lowest moment point um, business-wise and how you push through? And then what's been the proudest moment for you? Um. 
Hmm. The, I had two low moments. One of them I wrote about, and I'll just briefly tell that story. Yeah. I, um, um, I, I remember sitting in the driveway of my house, and we literally, I literally once again, so because I'm a home run swinger, I'm either going to hit a wonderful home run or I'm going to hit double and triple plays. And I had just got done hitting a double play, bad, scraped our knee, um, lost us a lot of money. And um, I'm sitting in the driveway of my house. I'm about to go in and lead a church group about success and leadership and how awesome you are. And I've got $30,000 left in the bank. No, probably a little less. And I can't make payroll. Hmm. And oh. I literally am praying to the Lord, saying, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? You want me to just pack it up, go some other way, knock out the economies of the people we have? Or, you know, what should I do? I get a phone call out of nowhere, like divine intervention type stuff. And it's my internal account. And she says, hey, were you expecting a check from this affiliate network? Uh, I'm like, no. She goes, it was like for $33,000. It's exactly what we need to make payroll. What wow. should I do? And right at that moment, this is my low moment. Well, it wasn't the success part. I literally considered cashing that check and not making payroll. Mm. And I remember right at that moment being like, how low did I have to get to where I actually literally had a prayer answered for me and I was considering being a fool. And I remember going inside the house and admitting to everyone in my home mm. that literally I was at my lowest thinking about stealing the money that would have did exactly what we needed to do in our business. And the second one was when I landed from a vacation to see my face on the front of the news that we had just got sued by our attorney general for violation of a contract by the company that bought our business. Holy cow. And they, they named us in the lawsuit. And I thought, how fun is that when the general counsel and almost quasi elder of a church gets named in a lawsuit and I had to go deal with our elders and all that stuff. That was a pretty low moment for me. Usually, but it was a yeah. big character builder. The low moment wasn't the church. And the low moment wasn't the people in our church. The low moment there was skinning the knee in front of my cheerleader. It's the first time I'd ever really fail, failed in front of the bride. And so, but you mm. know, I look back, I look back at that and um, it was a wonderful part to our marriage. Yeah. So I don't look back at it. I tell that story proudly yeah. because it actually helped Deb and I um, work through the tough things in life, not continue yeah. to act like we've got this like rock star life where we don't have things. My best thing, Jeremy. Um, well, I want to stick on that for one second because what's yeah. really interesting about you and is it transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, I don't know, I can't speak for most people, but a lot of people maybe would have thought that, put it aside and just done whatever. But you decided to go into that house and admit it to everyone. I had to. I so I, you know it's funny. My wife will joke. One of the quirky things you want to know about me is this: um, I um, I I have a my brain cannot get off something, and so if I go to bed thinking about something, I will literally live it out in my dreams. Mm. My little son Vinny, my little Vin, has the same issue. He'll get up, run around the house, and <laughs> he'll be, be all active in his thing. Well, I'm very much the same way. So, mm. like, if I tell myself like um, like I, that itches. And if my brain thinks about it itching, next thing you know, my whole body starts to itch. And I have this thing. So my brain will be consumed yeah, on it. Right. So if I don't go deal with it, I see. I'm going to deal with it anyway. Yeah. So, so I might way as well bring everyone into it. it. Yeah. I literally, so I'm thankful that, you know, because I was taught the opposite of that. I was taught shove it down. Mm. And it's what led to some physical unhealth. It's what led to, uh, you know, not trusting in people. It's what led to, uh, uh, probably even moments of uh, unclear or depressive type thinking. And so I would encourage everyone, get it the freak out. Right. What's someone going to do? Yeah. Tell you they don't like you because you tell, you tell people the truth that you suck or your feet stink like everyone else's when your socks are off and, and your shoes are no longer on? Who cares, right? Right. I, I, quite honestly, if people on this show like me less because I told the truth about the things that suck, then they weren't someone I was going to impact anyway. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the proudest, someone of the proudest, obviously outside of your kids and and wife. Um, yeah, are we talking about in the work setting? Yeah, in the, yeah, business. or just in life, business. like what we, business setting. Yeah. It uh, it it um. So. I'm actually living some of my proudest moments, which is really cool. So I believe in a farm system. I told you that earlier, right? Yeah. And so Rachel, who I'm growing to be a world-class COO, is one of my finest moments. And mm. uh, 
So watching her, she was being trained to be a lawyer and is a licensed lawyer. And I made her take the bar. Once she started excelling in our system, she's like, oh, I won't take the bar exam. I'll just be in business. I'm like, you're taking the bar exam. And uh, so I forced her to do it. But I'm watching before my eyes. We're going to talk about her 10 years from now being one of the uh, premier COOs. And uh, so she's a wonderful accomplishment. And I love how what we've worked on is character building, not on all the structure and process of of team. So she's a wonderful, uh, um, she's almost like a daughter to me and she'll jokingly say I'm old enough that she could be my daughter. But, uh, that, that's a, that's a wonderful moment yeah. is that is, is the accomplishment of the team we're constantly building around yeah. here. And she's right at the front of that. Yeah. That's great. So everyone should check out fully accountable.com. Yeah. The total CEO.com. And if you want those resources, I don't know if you want to talk about them or people can just go. You yeah, can go so to fullyaccountable.com backslash or forward slash inspired or the total CEO.com forward slash inspired. Yeah, it's forward slash, not backslash. Forward slash, forward slash, slash yeah. inspired at the total CEO.com as well as fullyaccountable.com, both of them forward slash uh, insider. And so what we did is we have a brand new book coming out for Fully Accountable called uh, False Profits, Why 99% of uh, Entrepreneurs Fail. Mm. We should have that book out soon. And 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 since this is like the Library of Congress, your show will be up forever. We will put up the free link to that inside of Fully Accountable. But for now, you know, we, we are giving out a free copy of the, my latest and greatest soon to be bestseller. Amazing. Yeah, um, very we generous also have my, of you. Thank you. Yeah, we also have a copy to my original book, which is a bestseller, called The Best Investment, A Better You. That's in there for you. We also have included links to your core metrics that we want everyone to use. So we have a bunch of resources and tools for that. We also have an uh, example uh, core financials and management statements that we'd like to see you using in the way of, of uh, capturing the real numbers in your business. And we've also included um, some team uh, hiring uh, pieces that would be great for you and your team, and so we yeah. have a treasure trove of stuff there, and uh, we hope that you are your world, your people, your entrepreneurs find that helpful. Vinny, thank you again, and I really appreciate all your time. People, check it out, and the CEO's mindset. I mean, you can go on there. I bought it. I bought the physical copy and also the audio version, um, just so I could listen to it. It's it's hugely valuable for anyone. So. Cool. Thank you. Hey, but listen, by the way, I, not enough people hear this. I think your show is killer. Thank I would you. have said that at the beginning. I'm probably going to go out and shout it out on social media. You ask good questions. Your people should, if this is one of their first shows they're listening to, they should go and subscribe and listen to the other ones because you're like, not only are you living in that business who was the sponsor today for this, but your show is completely representative of you giving a crap. So appreciate it, bud. Thank you. Much appreciated, Vinny. You're appreciate awesome. It. See you, pal. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.